After listening to a radio show my friend recommended to me a few days ago called Lime Town, I had a weird question that I've had yet to really answer. For those who don't know, it's a mystery about this mysterious research town that's just disappeared one day. The clues and information the show Wait, gives... Wait, what? Okay. The clues and information the show gives was so captivating for me, I hypothesized for like 10 minutes before going to the next episode. And when the show ended, it wasn't what I thought. And when I read that back, I say, well, that's a cool thing, though, because it tricked me and still had the evidence from other episodes to back up the ending. But I was still disappointed because to me, my ending was better. My ending was tailored to my interests and quirks and feelings. And don't get me wrong, the ending fit and was good, but it wasn't the ending I convinced myself was interesting and exciting. It got me wondering that if you leave such a bizarre mystery with with up to interpretation clues, that whatever the real answer, the reader or viewer will always do to some degree be disappointed after their story ended up not happening. Do you think this is an actual problem? And if you do mm -hmm. think it's a problem, how could you work around it? Or is it just something that is bound to happen to some of the audience? Yeah. Well, that's all my questions for this month. Hope the move goes well and both you guys are doing rad. Excited for the God of War video and good luck on everything, Maxine. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. I spoke about that a little bit in the Witness video. People get really, really invested in stories and their versions of them. I think that it even has a term, right? It's called headcanon. It's something that you have to keep in mind when it comes to writing stories as well as enjoying stories. And I used to be this sort of person that would constantly be watching a movie and driving um, Lily crazy because I would just constantly be guessing what would happen next to be like, oh, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. And most of the time I'd be right and I'd be trying to deconstruct the story as I was watching it. And I don't think it's a good way of appreciating content. It's not healthy either. And you end up not really enjoying stories as much as you should. I've tried really, really hard lately to not do that anymore, but it still comes through when I'm streaming a bit. Like Persona 5, I kept guessing things and everything. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. But then it comes into danger of you getting so invested into it, especially when it comes to TV shows that go on and on and on, that you start to connect these different dots and you start to think that your way is not only what's going to happen, but it's better, and that you're disappointed when it doesn't happen. You might be angry as well and you can't really appreciate what the thing actually did. But that's not to say that you're always wrong. Um, I, I'm gonna hate saying this. I'm gonna regret saying this. So I finally watched The Last Jedi, and it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And I'm upset that a lot of the discussion about The Last Jedi has been wrapped up in this tired old political debate because I don't think there's anything to do with politics and anything that might be seen as political in the movie or anything like that has anything to do with why the movie's bad. The movie's bad because it's a bad fucking movie. Um, it's a really, 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 really bad movie. The only good things about it were the visuals. And even then, there were some shortcomings there. There were some really awful moments in a fight scene that I don't want to spoil that made me go, what? And yeah, really, really, really not, not a good movie. And I think a lot of people are wrapped up in this better version that they had imagined and were anticipating. And I think it's a good example of the audience probably being right for the most part. And I don't know. I don't know how you could watch that movie and think that it's a good story on any level. It's not a good story on its own. It's not a good story in the series. It's not a good story in any way. It doesn't have good structure, it doesn't have good characters, it doesn't have good dialogue really, you know, it's, it, 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 yeah. oh man, it's such a, it's such a bad movie. I don't know what I'm going on about it. It's really, really not a good movie at all. But sometimes people are wrong and they will get so invested in, I don't think you're wrong for liking it because maybe you liked it for other reasons other than what I'm saying. Maybe you like the visuals or the fight scenes, or maybe you, you just like to just like, sit back with some popcorn and enjoy, you know, just some dumb action movie, you know? On that level, it's okay. Like I said, the visuals and the fight scenes had some merit to them. But yeah, it, it just, it just, oh man, it was, and I'm, I'm not even the type of person that's really invested in Star Wars. I've only ever seen the original trilogy once. I've only seen the prequels once each. I'm sure at some point I've been at someone's house and it's been on in the background. And, but yeah, I, I've, I'm not a big Star Wars fan. Uh, just, I, I'm just looking at it as, as someone who, 
likes pop culture a bit and I know those are big events and I should see them and, and it's like okay it's somewhat interesting but yeah like I thought The Force Awakens was okay it was just okay and I was expecting The Last Jedi to be just okay as well and it wasn't it was really 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 bad there was a certain point in the movie that I don't want to say because I don't want to spoil it that I actually just completely threw my arms up in the air and said okay this whole entire series is a death <laughs> <laughs> that's it it's done i was live tweeting my watching the movie to my friend on steam because it was on netflix that's when i got to see it i watched it over three nights because that's how that's how we roll over here yeah that's that's the only little time i had you know I, I i was trying to wind down before i went to sleep and that wasn't a good idea you know because i'm watching that yeah without spoilers it was toward the end of the movie when a certain purple haired character does something with a starship that i threw my arms up in the air and typed very angrily and very snootily to my friend I'm done with this entire series, it's dead. And then at that point, I was just like, I don't give a shit what happens anymore. I almost turned the movie off and didn't even finish it, but at that point, I was committed. I was like, yeah, whatever. Anyway, to get back to your question in terms of video games, you can see this in Dark Souls. You can see it in The Witness. You can see it in any story that has a lot of ambiguity. What's interesting, though, in your question specifically, though, which makes me not be able to go on my usual rant, which is that people will transplant their own ideas and they'll go through their own story writing process and they will make their own art when they're watching a movie or reading a book or playing a game that has a lot of ambiguity, is that your example actually had an answer that came out that was disappointing. And I think you'll see this a lot with alternate reality games. If you don't know what they are, I think one of the most popular ones was I Love Bees for Halo. Portal 2 had one for its release too as well, I believe. And these are usually, they're cool in concept, but they're usually disappointing. There are clues that are on websites, phone numbers. There might even be a real world location you have to go to to find something. You know, there's coordinates, GPS coordinates that you have to track down through scrambled images. And it's usually a community effort of a lot of people solving like math problems and stuff that have been put out there and with clues and breadcrumbs leading to each one. My guess is there's probably planted people in the communities that grow for these things that will nudge others along if they get stuck or something. You know, they're there, you know, playing dumb, but they're, they're really a part of the experience. And people build these up to be these huge epic things and oh my God, what's gonna happen in the end? And they're almost usually disappointing. But the key point of that is that they have answers. And a lot of these games that are ambiguous, Dark Souls, The Witness, inside little nightmares there's so many of them in video games because writing is so difficult and it's even more difficult in video games so a good answer to that is just not to bother they don't have answers at all because there are no answers in my opinion you can disagree with me i know that's something that a lot of people disagree with me on but i won't harp on about it too much here you have an answer and i think it's more interesting when there's an answer that you're disappointed in because it kind of proves me wrong doesn't it it kind of proves me wrong and it makes it seem like there's worth and there's merit to these kind of stories that let people figure things out for themselves and come to their own conclusions and i do see the appeal to it definitely i just got to the point now maybe it's because i'm a writer myself that i prefer to be told a story rather than have to do the work. But yeah, when you're writing a story, you definitely have to do that. It was interesting to me that there have been writers for, I think, comic books, definitely TV shows, that said that they've had to follow discussion forums now. And if someone guesses the story, Lily will find this interesting. If someone guesses the plot and ending of the story, that they sometimes have to change it. Sucks for them. Yeah, that really sucks for them. And they have to think of something new because they might be liable or something. Like someone yeah, might come after them. them and of, yeah, that you stole this idea from the community, which I think is complete bullshit. I don't think it would actually fly, but maybe it's just not worth the risk. And also, I think if it becomes popular enough, they think that, oh, well, we have to have something new. We have to twist it on that, right? We can't. There has to be an element of surprise. Yeah, that, that can ruin a story, I think. It's definitely something you have to keep in mind. Um, but I also think that it's something that maybe you have to keep in mind as a consumer or an, an audience member that maybe you should trust the storyteller and not try to speculate too much. I think Kurt Vonnegut said that you should try to give the reader as much information as possible as early as possible so that if for whatever reason their book got cut in half that they would still be able to finish the story themselves. Ironically, all the stories I've read of his are not like that at all. And you can't do that, but maybe I'm not understanding his quote that much. It seems like modern storytelling that we're in right now, post postmodernism or whatever the fuck it counts as now, seems to be the complete antithesis of that. And we're all about stories that will not tell you anything and try and keep you in the dark and confused and enthralled for as long as possible. 
until the very, very end where it's supposed to be this big explosive, like, oh my god, this came out of nowhere, and yeah, you didn't see this, and here's the last piece of the puzzle that you didn't get, and here it goes in. And I've written stories like that, so I'm guilty of that too, but... I try not to do that. You try not to do that? I try not to, because I'm worried of people accusing me then of making it up as they go along and just pulling something out, you know, out of, yeah. at the last minute, you know? Whereas I prefer to have all the pieces there and then make them forget about them so then then bring them back later kind of thing i think that works oh well they can do that too it's yeah especially with murder mysteries right if if all the clues are there at the beginning but you zoom in on one or you zoom in on a certain person and then it turns out that the other person there was there all along but that you weren't really looking at them yeah but instead of just not saying anything and it coming out later kind of thing. Well, there are different ways to do it. There, there, there's good ways to do it and there are bad ways to do it because some people do just make it up as they go along. I, I, I know, uh, I don't know for a fact, but I want to because Hyperbole is my friend. Lost, they just made that up as they went along. I, 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 I feel it in my bones that they make Dark Souls up as they go along. Like they, they, There's no plan. There's no design document. And you can never work it out on your own. You know, So that's part of the fun, isn't it? That but you you could. It's just that... If they were making it up as you go along, you can't keep up with that. It's, it's just that you're making it up as you go along too, and it seems just as valid as what they're saying because there is no right answer. You know what I mean? I think it was Dennis Lehane. He was on a plane. He was sat next to somebody... And the guy recognized him and said, oh, fuck Dennis Lehane, I, I really like your books. And he whipped out his copy of Shutter Island because he had it on him for some reason for the point of the story and said, I just read this book and I figured it out from the start. But he's like, I figured it out from the start. I knew right away what it was. I knew right away what was going on in this book. And Lehane was like, well, I'm, I'm glad you did because, you know, I, I played it fair. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't cheat. I didn't blindside anybody. I didn't put any, you know red herrings or false bits of information you know like i played it straight so yeah it's good that you figured it out but you know wouldn't you have enjoyed it more if you hadn't yeah but i I think that a lot of stories just they just make it up as they go along and they and they plant false information that never comes back um there's we'll be seeing it on stream soon when we play heavy fucking rain there's a scene but if you've played heavy rain you know what i'm talking about the just, just the completely unexplained bullshit in the opening of that game really really early on fucking heavy rain man what was the question again? <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that all entertainment, all video games, movies, books, it's a two-way street. There's a relationship and there's an obligation on the reader's part as well as the storytellers. And if you are potentially going out of your way to think of a better story than what you're being provided, then maybe that's a sign that maybe you should be a storyteller. But at the same time, I do sympathize heavily with what you're saying because sometimes the story that you think of yourself is better and you wish that they had put more effort into it there have been a lot of times especially in games where there's been a lot of details and a lot of ingredients let's say and you're getting through the whole thing and by the end you're like oh where's this building what's gonna happen and then there's just this big huge avalanche of disappointment when it just doesn't come together or it was just a bunch of bullshit details to throw you off and you're like oh that's it you know xenoblade chronicles 2 is like that at the end it's like oh that's it you know Persona 5 was a little bit like that as well. Usually in games, it's the smaller, more personal individual stories of characters and environmental storytelling and maybe, you know, logs that you find on the small scale within larger worlds that end up being more satisfying and more entertaining. I think that maybe a lot of games should try and focus on that instead of trying to have this big overarching story in the world. Books tend to be a little better. There are a lot of bad books out there. You can find mine on Amazon. And for movies, I don't watch that many movies anymore, but it can definitely be disappointing. Is it really the game's fault if you're the one building up this idea in your own head? Yes and no. It depends on if they're playing fair. That is a good point, and I think that's something that I wanted to bring up, but I forgot. It's your fault and the game's fault. You're both kind of culpable, because if the game is providing you with a lot of teases, and you find yourself really engrossed in thinking about a lot of things, then that's a sign that the story is working, and it's and it's captivating you, that there's something being done well on the story's part. And so it's the story's fault for not capitalizing on that and not making good on that potential. But at the same time, you're right. What if the story that you make up is complete bullshit? And if someone else heard your version of the story, they might look at it and go, yeah, but what about this? What about that? What about this problem? That problem? Maybe your version is unrealistic and it wouldn't really work well. But at the same time, stories should try and capitalize on their potential, I think. Anyway. What writing advice would you give to someone who has never enjoyed writing or storytelling? I know the textbook method to improve at writing is just to practice by writing regularly, 
but to me this feels like the English class equivalent of being told to get good. I've always envied how concise and articulate some people can be, but again, I'm sure those abilities simply come with practice. I don't think anyone would ever call me concise. <laughs> <laughs> I think that 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 uh, I'm a bit long-winded, but not as much as many people say. Usually I have multiple points, and that's why. I don't consider anything that I do to be essays that are only supposed to have one point, you know? So. Uh, some of the writing you did, though, like Monster Slayer and stuff, mm -hmm. you got more concise as you went in yeah. terms of tone. So you do have potential to be, to be brief. <laughs> Just aren't. I think it's my style to be a little on the longer side. I like that. I, I don't think all writing should be the same, you know? I don't think everything should follow the same style. I think it's, it's a big flaw in a lot of writing in, in the last century that, you know, the best way to be a writer was just to sound like a, an old stuffy Englishman, you know? I, th I think that's a there's a lot of stories that are going to be lesser for it forever because they were written in that, this is the proper style and you must be like this, you know? No, there's lots of different styles. So it's going to depend on what you want to do. Why do you want to be a storyteller? Why do you want to be a better writer? Do you want to write stories and sell them? You know, do you want to make money as a writer? Is that something you've always wanted to do? Because I know a lot of people have that in them even though they've never written before. If that's the case, then my advice to you is to just not. Because if you don't have it bursting out of you, it's just not worth it. If you are going to be a writer because you just want to write stories because you just want to write them for your own amusement or for the amusement of others that you know and you're going to share your stories to a small group of people, okay, then that's definitely worth it. But if your goal is to make money and you are asking me this question, then my answer to you is unfortunately don't bother. Do something else instead. Follow something that you're already passionate about because it's harder than ever right now to make money through writing. If you just want to be more articulate, if you just want to be better at communicating with other people, that's a different sort of writing than it is for you know writing fiction or writing arguments. Although the basis of all conversations are really a series of arguments and points. I want to say this, what's the best way to say it? How do I support my points? That sort of thing. The best class that I ever took for that was not a creative writing class or an English class. It was actually a philosophy class that taught the fundamentals of logic and what is a bad argument what's a sound argument, you know, uh, there's a construction of arguments there, which is that you have a statement and then you support it. And the first thing you have to look at is, does the second statement support the first one? And there's a way to break things down and identify them and to see if they do follow, if the argument is sound. There were examples that I can't remember right now, but there's probably ones that you can find very easily on Google. You know what I mean? I think there's one that was the moon looks like cheese. Therefore, the moon is made of cheese. And that was an example of an argument that it does support. There is some support there. Those statements do link, but it's not sound. It's not a correct argument because there's not enough information, but it's better than saying the ocean is made of water. Therefore, the moon is made of cheese. You know what I mean? Like that, that is a weaker argument than the moon looks like cheese. Therefore, the moon is cheese. So that kind of basis, which sounds really stupid when you first learn it, but learning all that stuff was invaluable to me. It was very, very important. So if that's what you want to, if that's your goal, then you might want to look into stuff like that and argument construction. For writing, yeah, unfortunately you are correct. It's, it's just practice. You need to read as much as possible and you need to write as much as possible. And read. Yeah. I find that I was actually reading back the book that I'm reading, I'm writing now. Um, I haven't touched it in months now, especially with the move and everything. And I read it back today and I can actually see with the writing how I've kind of gotten stylistic stuff out of other books that I've mm -hmm. read. I can kind of see where I picked things up, where I used certain words, and I was reading it back and going, oh, this is this is decent, this is okay, I can pick up from here, I can go with this, you know, it's not as, you know, you never want to read it back and go, this was shit, I have to start all over again. But I really did see where I was... It happens. Where I was, yeah. It does happen, but you never want that to happen, yeah. you know, obviously, I wouldn't want to read it back, and I was pleased with what I read in that, again, probably because of where I got it from, right, that I, I'm kind of emulating other writers that I, I enjoy their books. So if you don't want to write and going to be forced to write to practice, maybe try reading more and maybe getting inspired a little bit by what you're reading and, and seeing what you like about it and seeing what you don't like about what you're reading and seeing what you can kind of take away from it and use yourself. Because I've spoken to quite a few people that get lots of ideas, you know, and they want to write. 
they have these ideas, they have the story in their head, but they can't get it out and they get very frustrated with, you know, they can't get beyond the idea, they can't tell the actual story. So maybe reading other people to tell their stories or even listening to audiobooks or something if that's not your thing, like, you know, kind of try and copy them a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't have to copy the whole thing, but, you know, take something from this one and maybe you, you, you like Stephen King, you want to take something from him, you like Anne Rice, you want to take something from her, you like John Irving, you want to take something from him, that kind of thing, and, and just kind of put your own spin on it. The reality of our world is that unless there's some new discovery, which, you know, I would say computers are, are, are a relatively new discovery and there was a lot of, you know, work that needs to be pioneered. And there are definitely things like that going on in the world right now, but the chances of anyone like listening to me that it's going to be in that sort of field is very, very low. The reality is that, you know, everything has been done before. Now, that does not mean that you can't do anything new. I think a lot of people misunderstand that or they misuse it when they say that sort of thing. But if you were to learn how to cook, I'm going to say that because it's a, it's a food analogy and that always makes me laugh because it's, it's become a meme, but also because everyone eats, okay? Everyone eats. If you wanted to learn how to cook, you would be a fucking idiot if you just went out and bought all the ingredients you could find, ignored every single cookbook, ignored every single recipe, went into the kitchen and just tried to make shit on your own. Because not only would you waste so much resources and so much money, you'd also be wasting your time because there are things that have already been discovered and already have been accepted as true. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, you know, buck tradition and experiment, but, you know, why on earth would you waste your time discovering things that have already been set as close to objective fact as you possibly can? You should learn as much as you possibly can from cookbooks, from recipes, and then spend the time experimenting and learning and discovering and adding to that knowledge. There's a really good visual that's said about what it's like when you picture a circle and you are in the middle of the circle. Like, picture a circle on a piece of paper and you're a dot in the middle. And learning in any subject is like a line extending from the middle of the circle to the edge of the circle. And that's you going from first introduction with the subject to getting your master's. And once you get your master's, you have completed the line and you have gained most of the knowledge that we already know about the subject. And then you as that line push the circle out a little bit with your new discoveries and your new knowledge and then the next person that's behind you has a little longer to get to the edge of the circle and hopefully education becomes more efficient and doesn't take longer because your new discovery and that's what you know that it, sh it should be um and the same goes for writing the same goes for learning how to communicate you know there have been discoveries that have been made beforehand you know techniques if you're going to sit there and try and learn them yourself would you probably you'd probably get there but why not benefit from other people having already done it and spent all that time that you could have used to learn something that's completely new or your own style and your own twist on things so yeah read as much as you possibly can every single time you read it should be this opportunity to harvest things i like that word harvest not just techniques but also words if you ever read a book and you do not know what a word means like chances are you have internet access on your phone or you have Wi-Fi where you are or or whatever. If, if, if in the worst case, pull out your phone and just text the word to yourself and then later on look it up in the dictionary. There's no shame in doing that. And another piece of tangible advice I would give is that don't be afraid to question anything that you see in a book, even if it's a classic, even if it's great expectations. If there's anything you read and makes you make, you know, a sound like Scooby-Doo, what? Like what? If you don't understand something, don't just assume that it's because you're an idiot and this this great classic book must obviously be flawless because that's not the case. There have been mistakes in books that have been published and republished in different editions, and and sometimes these mistakes are added because they weren't copied over properly. Sometimes editions there's a shitty editor that decided. To to slip some changes in against the author's wishes maybe the author is even dead you know always question it and don't just blindly follow it and maybe it's worth investigating and maybe you find out that it does make sense but you don't even agree with it you don't like it you can disagree with some of the best authors at their heart you know i don't like the way he did this even though this is one of the best books ever written that's fine i guarantee you the best book ever written someone out there hates it and and they're right to hate it you know it's no masterpiece um yeah so and plan well when it comes to writing? To, if you're well, going to tell a story plan, well, I find the more that you plan and the more that you know your characters and the more that you 
you know what's going to happen. You know, it, you really kind of set yourself up for it. It's a lot easier to actually do the writing part of it because you know exactly where you're going with it. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm I'm the type where I can't I can't plan everything as much as Joe does because I get bored once I know the ending to everything and I know every scene and I know every chapter and I know how it ends and like I, I need to leave myself a few loose ends so that I don't get completely bored with it, with how I write that, that's for me that's what works for me it might work for you that way you might be more like Joe Joe is more of a plans everything and knows has keywords he wants to use and I want to slip this line in there somewhere and you know to that extent he plans and that's that's what works for him but I just found um, having little blurbs even about my characters, about why they are the way they are, a theme I wanted to talk about, a certain image I wanted to put in there, you know, that kind of thing really opened it up for me and made it a lot easier for me to actually sit down and, and write a paragraph. And if you write enough paragraphs, then there's your story, right? So you just break it down. Well, it's going to depend, again, what's the goal, right? And we don't know the goal. But yeah, if they want to write stories, definitely. I guess they did say storytelling. I think that everyone is a storyteller, really. And I know that sounds so fucking trite, but everyone, you know, just... Even if you want to tell some dumb story, you know, what happened to you and you went to the grocery store that day. I think I think everyone c- could be a storyteller if they wanted to. And it's in everyone to discover, I think. It might not be your livelihood, but I think it can be there. I think so, anyway. I hope that's good enough advice. It's, it's such a broad topic. I don't. I don't know what else to say. But yeah, I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. My parents, especially my dad, would read to me a lot when I was very young, and I'm really grateful that he did that because I don't remember this, but I was told they only used to really read to me at night, and it got to the point where I wanted to read during the day, and my dad was at work, and my mom was too busy, you know, smoking, and you know so i decided to take it upon myself that well screw it i'm just gonna learn how to read by myself obviously i did not teach myself how to read but i pushed very hard you know i want to learn how to read by myself and i put the effort in while my dad was reading me the story so when i went to first year of school like i already knew how to read and no one else did i wasn't like an advanced reader i was still reading like kids books and i probably didn't understand all of the subtleties and nuances and all this other shit even though they're kids stories and by kids stories i don't mean alice in wonderland i mean Thomas the Tank Engine, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle book, or, you know, Super Ted, you know, like, th- things like that. And from there, reading those made me want to write and tell stories. And I enjoyed doing that even from a young age. I learned to read when I was four, too. Do you have any tips on writing scripts? I got inspired by your works and want to give a try on making one. How do you usually start to write scripts? I don't really know where to start. Beginning a project is the hardest part of it. And I think a lot of people get stuck there and they never get past that initial phase of just staring at the cursor, just blink, 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 blink in the Word document or open, I use open office, I don't use Word. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people don't get past that. Planning can help a lot. So really map out what you want to say, when you want to say it. Every single script that I write usually has about, there's usually thousands of words of notes that are in the Word file already before I start writing that uh, I can reference and, and I can kind of make a roadmap to what I want to do. Writing style is going to matter a lot as well. So I can give you the general basic advice that is you should try and get through it every single day. You should do a little bit of writing every single day. I'm not very disciplined, but when it comes to this, I, I, do, I, I am successful with writing every single day because I get obsessive about finishing projects. So it's just sort of, I just kind of lucked into the fact that I will write every single day as much as I possibly can, especially when it comes to the end of scripts and also writing fiction. So you want to be really regular about it. You don't want to go long periods of time without writing. It will make you finish projects, but it will also make them feel a lot smoother and a lot more put together. You know, if if you write something and it's a 10,000 word script, 10,000 words is not a lot in terms of writing projects like novels, when you're writing a novel, it's not a novel until you get over 50,000, really. And that's a really short novel. It's practically a novella. So 10,000 words for a script is quite quite large, but it's not a big writing project. If you start, you know, write 2,000 words of your 10,000 word script, and then you go away for two months and come back and you write more, chances are it's going to feel quite stilted and it's not going to feel very smooth. So you want to get through that. You want to write as much as possible, not just for getting projects done, but also because you want them to be as smooth as possible. John Irving talks about this a lot when it comes to his books, that he likes them all to feel like he said them with one breath. You know, it was it's all one, one 
one sitting, one conversation, even though his books are crazy, crazy, crazy long. And I agree with that. I, I, with what he says, I'm nowhere near as good as John Irving, and I never will be, but I definitely agree with what he says there, and that was important advice for me to learn. Yeah, apart from that, general advice is going to come down a lot to style. Do you want to be someone that is very technical? Do you want someone that wants to be quite dry with your delivery? Do you want there to be a lot of jokes? Do you want there to be a lot of pop culture references? Do you want your videos to be very, very structured? Do you want to have title cards that lead from this part to that part to this part to that part? Do you like if, if it depends on what you're discussing as well? Um, you need to make those decisions and you need to write your script knowing that. Do you want to split your videos up into multiple parts and upload them separately? Because if that's the case, then you should probably have refreshers at the beginning of all of them and links to the end. And this gets into the medium is the message sort of thing, you know? If you're writing for TV, and you are writing something that's gonna be on a network that has commercials every 15 minutes, then um, the unfortunate reality is that every 15 minutes you better have a cliffhanger because otherwise people are gonna change the channel when the commercials come on and you're gonna lose your audience and no one's gonna watch your show and your show's gonna get canceled and you won't have a writing job anymore. So the medium and how it's presented is going to affect how your writing comes across so that's very very important for me i focus on flow i want there to be this seamless transition between a lot of subjects and a lot of topics where possible sometimes videos are so long that they can't function that way and there's times where i've experimented with title cards and stuff to see because i'm always trying to do something new in every single video even if it's only a little thing that's new i like there to be just I'm talking about this and I'm talking about that and you don't really notice that I've switched from one topic to the other and I link them both together in a way and suddenly you you look at the time and half an hour has gone by. That's how I like to write. I probably write that way in fiction as well, but yeah, that's, that's how I write in scripts, but just because that's how I write doesn't mean that's how you should write, so you have to make those decisions yourself. So I'll end with probably the biggest piece of advice or the best piece of advice that I think I've ever read about writing, which applies to script writing and fiction writing and any writing, which is don't try to emulate the voice of anyone else. You do have to make sure that your stuff is mostly grammatically correct. It doesn't really matter all that much, to be honest. You know, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect grammatically correct, like that sentence was that I just said right, right now. It doesn't have to be. It's ignore anyone that says that it has to be you should try to, to, to do your best but th the rule is if your point is being made without any ambiguity whatsoever you're okay try to do better always try to aim to be as perfect as you can but it's not really that important spelling is something that's very very easy to do because you know you it's you, every time you write you're going to have a, a spell checker there but do make sure that you're using the right words that were properly those are objective things that you need to get right with word choices and all that stuff. But when it comes to how sentences are put together and how paragraphs are constructed and the tone that you go with a more casual, more serious, anything like that, be yourself. Try to write like you speak. And if you are telling a story to somebody or if you haven't told a story to somebody out loud in a long, long time or you've never, you know, tried to explain something in depth to someone in a long, long time in person, find a victim. It could be a, a girlfriend, a, a sibling, a parent, um, a friend that got you a really, really bad Christmas present and you want revenge, and just sit them down and make them listen to you talk. Try and summarize the plot of a TV episode or a book or anything like that just as an experiment, and maybe even record yourself doing it, and try and pay attention to how you speak and how what feels fluid and comfortable to you and try to make an emulated version of that when you're writing because that is your natural sort of tone and your natural sort of way of communicating and that's what makes you unique and there's enough people trying to to be stuffy and talk the same way and communicate in the same way you go on reddit and almost every single comment sounds like it's written by the same goddamn person you could change the usernames and you wouldn't even know. And it's weird if you go on other websites, you'll notice that it's the same thing, only it's different than the other websites. Every comment on 4chan, on V, 
sound like they're written by the same person who likes to go to V. You go on Reddit and it's different, it's different from, from V, but it still sounds like the same sort of person that's on Reddit. It's like there's one person on Reddit that's making all the posts, there's one person on 4chan that's making all the posts. Same for every other forum. There's a norm that becomes accepted and a kind of culture that kind of shifts and you want to avoid that because you don't want to be that. You don't want to just blend in. You want to have your own twist and your own unique kind of voice that's there. Yeah, so apart from that, we're getting to specifics and I don't know you, fortunately. So you'd have to figure that out for yourself. So what do you think is more important in a story? The story or the characters and the narrative or the theme? Depends on the story, but in general, I like stories over characters and I like narrative over theme but it's going to depend on the story. Sometimes I will watch something or read something for the characters more than the story. That can be really engaging and really fun, but I'm going to say that most of the time it's narrative over theme for me. The theme doesn't really interest me all that much most of the time, and I prefer something more concrete than that. In one of your prior Q&As, you mentioned writing a novel being akin to self-imposed madness. Mm Mm-hmm, yep. I remember. I'm curious as to how you think said madness can affect a person, and if writing any of your novels actually changed your personality or worldview or anything similar. I'm also curious as to what your relationship is to your characters. I ask because I've spent the last seven or so years focusing on one story, broken up into arcs, which I restarted from scratch numerous times until settling on a first-person, relatively stream-of-consciousness style. This meant I had to get a very solid grasp on my protagonist's character, since it wasn't just writing her actions in dialogue, it was delving into her mind and writing out exactly what her thoughts, or lack thereof, would be throughout. As time went on, some of my real-life behaviors started to mimic hers, and vice versa. She's incredibly important to me in many ways, but so far, for all my efforts, it's been nigh impossible to explain to other people what she means to me, and who she is to me. I have a hard time imagining I'm alone in experiencing this, but it sure feels like it sometimes. Self-imposed madness is as best a descriptor I've come across. It sounds like she's important to you. It's a form of therapy, maybe? Like, I know it may sound a little unorthodox to call it therapy, but I could see that being therapeutic. Sort of like an alternative to a space that might be taken up by some people from journal writing. But I don't know your character and I don't know your process, so I don't know how I would know for sure. I can relate, I think. I've learned quite a lot about myself from writing, not only by thinking of things that are outside of my comfort zone, but also every single character that you write is a part of you and represents a facet of yourself, whether they are good, evil, fair, unfair, petty. It's unavoidable. It has to come from you. And you will always learn something about yourself while you're doing that because you will learn how petty you can be, how your thought process can go. I don't think writers are born. I think writers are made in any profession, any vocation. I don't believe there are callings. I believe that some people will be naturally better suited to different things depending on the hand that they were given. But in terms of the person that you are, I don't think that is decided at birth. I think that's decided probably so early on that you can't control a lot of it, but I don't think it's decided at birth. Events will happen to you when you're young or you will learn to do this as you write, but you will have a very, very overactive imagination. And sometimes it'll be a good thing and sometimes it'll be a really, really bad thing. I tend to expect the worst. Quite vividly too, and Lily's the same, and Lily's a writer, and I remember one of the times that I realized we were very compatible was when we were speaking. I don't know if she'll remember this, but it was a long time ago. She said something like, do you ever think that whenever you're in the shower, what would happen if you fell over, hit your head and died right now? Like, do you ever think, you know, how would they find you? When would they find you? What would happen? Like, like the whole thing, you know? And I was like, yeah, like all the time. And it's that kind of line of thought, this kind of sequence of events, what would happen? Not always bad, but good too, you know? Like, what would happen if you just died right now? What would happen if this was blah, 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 blah? And you have to kind of get into a different mindset when you are writing, and it has to be authentic. So when you are writing a murder mystery, you kind of have to pretend to be a psychopath. You have to be... And I do. Yeah, you have to plan a murder. I mean, I think most people have probably maybe had the thought, I don't know, I say most people and I say maybe and I softened it because I don't want to be called out and being called crazy, but I'll be brave. I think most people have probably had the thought, I would make a really good serial killer. And I I don't know, I, I, I think most people have probably plotted out at least one murder in their life and like, could I get away with it just for fun? But you definitely do as a writer, you have to. I've written serial killer characters. 
It's not just even that, though. It's more than that because you have to plan out the murder, sure. And you have to find out how you want to tell it, which is mm-hmm. just as important as the actual story to me. It's how you tell it is equally as important. But you have to really get into the minds of your characters to know why they are killers and mm-hmm. what kind of person would they be to do something like that. And is that really true of their character? Would they do it like that or would they do it another way? Yeah. You know, are they crazy enough basically to pull it off? They have to be crazy, so you have to be crazy too. And I don't think it's possible to do something like that without learning something about yourself. You know, I think it's the sign when you've maybe matured a little bit as a writer. Not to say that I am a mature writer. I'm not. I have a lot left to learn. There's an unlimited amount to learn anyway, but yeah, I have a lot left to learn. And I would say that most of my early stories are only okay. And the later ones are when they start getting good. The sign that you're maturing as a writer is that when you look at the decisions of a character and think, I fundamentally disagree with you on every single level right now, but I'm still writing it and it still makes sense. I would never do this, what you're about to do right now, but this is what you would do and you are the character that I've made and this is still what has to happen. I've learned that maybe I'm not really all that interesting (laughs) through writing, you know, like I learned that I'm a bit of a hermit and when it comes to characters and I think, you know, what their motivations, what do they do for fun and everything. And I have to realize that I don't really do much things for fun that are all that interesting. I like to just, you know, I like to read. I like to watch TV and movies. I like to play my video games. I like to work. You know, and that was a bit of a struggle for characters to have interests and hobbies that felt authentic. And I think maybe that's a flaw in some of the stories. I think there's some of my characters that are very similar in that regard. There are pieces of me in every book in terms of plot. Of course. But there aren't that many pieces of me in my characters. I tend to write characters who are kind of opposite me to a point that I would actually like to be more like these characters. Even the crazy ones, even the ones who kill people, there's still something about them that is confident or very secure in themselves or, you know, something to that. Even if they're a bit asshole sometimes and they banter with each other and stuff, but I like that. And those seem to be the characters that I get more attached to and I am happiest with. They're the ones I miss when the book is over. Not the soft ones, it's the more hard characters that are a little bit unstable that I tend to miss. And at my low points, I've actually felt I could learn something from my characters. I wished in a way that I was more like them. So I think some people write characters that are like them. Yeah, but that's you. Other people write characters that are not like them. And that's you, you discovering the something same. through your books, yeah, then, you right? Still have you're, the same you're, effect. you're learning. You're learning from your characters, but you're the one who's making the characters. So yeah, you're definitely learning something through the process. And I get stronger it. with every book I write. Like the first novel I wrote. It was there a little bit. The second one, I really bonded with my characters. The third one, it took me three years to write because I wasn't bonding with her. And once I started to bond with her, then I was able to finish the book. Without that connection to her, I couldn't finish it. So he spoke about rewriting and going back and redoing it again and again and again. And I wouldn't doubt that probably every time he went back and redid it, he probably got stronger and stronger and a more connection to his protagonist because he was starting from scratch and building her up again and again. It was like, a reinvention almost right of her they spent the last seven or so years focusing on this one story and this one protagonist so it's no wonder this feels so connected to to her that like i've written how many books i think that the bigger period of self-imposed madness for me is the process of actually writing it's similar to video work it's mental juggling it's very stressful it's very difficult but it's also once you're done you feel really accomplished Juggling is probably the best way to do it. You have to keep so much in your head. If you've ever done difficult math, and of course difficult is going to be different for every single person that there is, but if you've ever tried to do a multiple stage difficult math problem in your head, it's sort of like doing that for hours, maybe even days, in extreme cases even weeks. And that's sort of why it's important to foster conditions that you can get back into a flow state. And your flow state's really important. Programmers talk about it as well. The flow state, some of you might be in it with video games as well, especially a game like this. It's important to get back into the flow state so you can get back into moving through it sort of almost on the same level as a machine rather than just a person going through that. I know that when I'm in the middle of that and I'm making a lot of progress and I'm losing myself completely to the work, an interruption is really, really frustrating. But it's really amazing when it happens because you completely forget who you are. I'll read something back and I'll say, wow, they don't sound like me at all. And they're not talking the way I would talk at all. They're not thinking the way I would think at all. 
and I don't really remember writing this. This just kind of came out over the last, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour that I wrote this and I don't remember it. And it kind of reads like something that I wouldn't even expect that I wrote, you mm -hmm. know, that it seems like it's so detached from you and yet you just wrote it, but you're not really aware that you wrote it. And those are the best scenes that I will ever write is when I don't even know that I wrote it. It just somehow just came out of me. So if there's any kind of madness or whatever, then I think being that cut off from everything and being able to do something like that, that to me makes sense. Madness. Okay, I think most people are going to be able to understand this. I think most people are like this, but maybe some people aren't. Maybe I'm completely wrong. This will be interesting to me if most people are like this. When I pronounce and say words, even when I'm reading them, I don't consciously ever sound anything out. I speak and I read out loud in the same mode that I write my signature. When you write on a piece of paper, you don't think, oh, how do I do an F? How do I do a U? How do I do a C? How do I do a K? You just, you know, you just do it. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's all in muscle memory, that sort of thing. That's how I speak and read. So when I get to something that I don't know or something I'm not really that familiar with, it's a double stumble. Cause I have to get out of that mode. And then I'm like, oh, what? That's why sometimes I, I, I struggle to say sentimentalism because I didn't get it right the first time. And now not only am I trying to, 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 to say it properly I'm also my brain is like shifting gears and I'm like oh wait wait what are we doing now you know so it's like that that's how I read out loud so I don't know if that's how most people do but that's how I do it hey again Joey long time no see hey David how's it going what was it that you and Lily studied in university? I took a, I was only at university for one year. People are usually curious why I didn't go for longer. Usually I just brush it off because I don't want to get into it. But for today, I'll say why. I went for one year shortly after my parents got divorced. We came back to Canada. My dad went back to Wales where we're from and I was living with my mom and my sister and I went to the first year university because it was just around the time we were graduating from high school and my mom during that year went literally insane and all the hatred and all of the fighting and all the pent-up frustration she had with my dad basically was just transplanted onto me and when I say literally insane, Lily can vouch for me, like the woman became physically abusive which was really funny because I don't think she realized that her son was now a man and, you know, tr she was not a big woman. <laughs> try, try, trying to hit someone when they can literally just hold up their hand and stop you doesn't get you very far. So yeah, after that I had to leave home and that's what happened with the university. That's why I stopped going. That was a pretty bad time. Yeah, for the first year, sorry, for the only year, I did an English course a philosophy course there was a science course you have to take i went in for a course on evolution anyway so my experience is much more limited than lily's i had the english class that i enjoyed quite a bit i had the evolution class which was kind of like a nothing kind of thing that we shouldn't even talk about it was basically the whole class was just a gimme grade it was basically can you read a textbook and answer very simple multiple choice questions on it that was it you know that was the whole class very 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 easy very very simple so if you're asking for advice for general university just to get a grade because at this point, sorry to be a jaded fuck, but why else would you want to go to university? You're just going to get the diploma so you can get a good job, right? You're not actually going to university to actually learn fucking something unless you're specializing greatly. Try and find one of those that's really easy and is a gimme grade, and then you can just coast by on that side of the classes. When it comes to the other ones, though, I can give you some advice when it comes to picking them and be very, 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 very thorough and very, very diligent about talking to the professor who runs the class or talking to someone who has taken the class or looking up the curriculum and really looking it up online and seeing what other people are talking about this class. I would say that unless you trust the professor for some reason, if it is a new course that's being offered, don't take it until someone else has taken it because otherwise you may end up in a situation that Lily and I ended up with this bullshit fucking literature course which was meant to be a look at literature during medieval renaissance. the medieval renaissance period that's what it was meant to be that's what it advertised itself as and we were quite excited about that because there were a lot of books in that era that we wanted to read and learn about and we like history yeah and we like history but what it was 
was a tour and sharp focus on boosting the representation of the very limited female authors that lived in that time and even outside of that time too. It was a politically charged course that did not present itself as that at all with two dueling, like the dueling banjos, the ding 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 ding, with two dueling female professors that were constantly trying to really, really push, you know, look, 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 push representation, push representation. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to say that going in. You know, you can't say, yeah, medieval renaissance literature class, and that's it. And then it's just nonstop bullshit. That's so much bias. I hated that class. However, I learned a lot from that class. First of all, I, f I fell asleep in one of the lectures, and I got stink eye from both of them. Remember that? I remember that. <laughs> you didn't know you were narcoleptic I didn't know yet. I was narcoleptic yet. No, I don't fall asleep. Narcoleptics don't fall asleep like they do stereotypically, but sometimes they do get sleep attacks that are very difficult to resist naturally falling asleep afterwards. It's not like you just drop down asleep, but yeah. But I, if you I, don't sleep at night. Then... Yeah. So I remember falling asleep like that. I suggest that you really pay attention to what the class is so you don't end up in a situation like this. But if you do, or you can learn from what I learned in this class, pander the fuck out of your audience. Your goal with essays in university, when it comes to liberal arts, okay? When it comes to anything, any other course, my advice is not applicable because in any other course, there is an objective answer. In a science class, in a math class, in all those classes that are actually worth a damn and actually teach you something, you can get a 100% perfect grade. You cannot get a 100% perfect grade in an English class, no matter what. You will never get one. You will, unless the professor is asleep or is making a statement by allowing you to do that. Because all of those classes, and the humanity classes as well, are opinion based. And no matter what, no matter if your argument is flawless, no matter if it is not a single spelling mistake, not a single grammatical error, every single argument that you make is backed up logically, well-cited, well-sourced, makes perfect sense, you will not get a perfect grade if the professor disagrees with what you're saying. Even though they should have to argue with you afterwards and be separate from the argument that you've put forward in the paper, it doesn't matter. You will still get marked down if they disagree with what you're saying. So the first goal that you should do whenever you're writing a paper or finishing an assignment for any of these classes is to figure out what the professor agrees with and then tailor your whole argument around that so you don't lose the gimme points that you should get from having the, you know, it's like, it's like a bonus no matter what. But even then, if you do write a perfect paper, you're still likely only going to get like a 99 or a 98% out of 100 because, well, I could have said this better myself or this sentence didn't really wow me as much or these aren't wholly original points outside of this People essay, like you know, that that's... professors have written books on the subject yeah. and have devoted their entire lives to teaching them and, and, and becoming experts in their field and they're teaching you, so you're not going to convince them of your point. You know, you're, you're not experienced and you don't have the material enough to, mm -hmm. to properly convince them. So therefore you might as well just agree with them. Yep. So find out what they want, find out what they have. The best thing you can do is because these professors rarely only teach one course, unless they're like visiting touring professors, like you're taking a course that is literally Neil Gaiman, like unless they're like that big rock star professor, they're likely teaching multiple courses. And they won't really remember everything that they say in the lectures. The best grade that I ever got on a paper was regurgitating the exact same arguments that the professor gave during the lecture. I mean, I wasn't even subtle. At that point, I figured that they had played a game by baiting everyone into this course. So I just played the game back and it was like, okay, well, how can I... I just fucked with it. What gets me a C? What gets me a B? What gets me an A? Like at one point, I just tried to see if I could get an extension on a paper and I just handed it in late and I wrote on the piece of paper, I'm very sorry that this is late, but it turns out that the topic of, <laughs> of this, of this woman's struggle <laughs> really spoke to me and engaged me more than I was expecting. So I'm really sorry that it's late, but that's why, and I didn't get, lose any marks for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was really late too. So you, you know, they like, just play with the system. If you do get a legitimate class, though, that the professor actually is presenting themselves well and genuine and is invested in the topic, treat that with an equal amount of respect. Like that's good. You know, like don't squander that because that is worth your time and worth your attention. But yeah, it comes back to that. The other advice I would say is, okay, I don't know how universities work anymore because it's been a long time since I've been in university, but I'm going to assume that there's still this back and forth between the lecture hall and then the group meetings afterwards, tutorial. the tutorials. Get in the professor's tutorial. Get in the professor's tutorial. Don't do the TA. Don't get the in TAs the TAs yeah. are better. They don't, work on the bus. Yeah, don't get into a TA, a teacher's assistant, a professor in training. Do not get into their tutorial. Try to get into the professor's tutorial. Unless you're really invested in getting a good grade with the least amount of effort possible long term, if you're willing to put the legwork in short term, you might want to talk to every single TA that's on that course and find the one that's kind of you know, kind of ditzy, and you think that you're going to get the best score from them, you know what They're I mean? It's still hard to tell, though. Yeah, it's I hard to tell. I had a very nice TA, and still, still, it was, it was nothing compared to when I, I had the professor. Yeah. So, I don't know, as you can tell, I'm pretty bitter about the whole thing, but I want to stress again, I want to repeat it, this is for liberal arts. For everything else, that's legit, okay? That's completely legit, and you know, it doesn't matter what disagreement you and the professor or teacher's assistant may have when it comes to how you're saying something, or what font you used, or whatever it is that they're nitpicking on you. Two plus two is still four, no matter what. You know what I mean? Like, they can't mark you down. So that's why it's different. But yeah, I look at a lot of these degrees as it's something that you just have to do just to get ahead. And years and years and years ago, you wouldn't need it. But now you have to because everyone started going to university. So now you have to, you know, keep that up, even though your job that you're trying to get your liberal arts degree for is probably doable with just a high school diploma. So they're gaming you out of money. So you should game back and you should try and figure out what is the most efficient way that you can get the grade that you need and get through it and teach yourself because you're going to be a better teacher than any of them unless you luck out and you get an extremely good professor. I know, just use the free time that you get from being efficient to work a part-time job or something and pay your extremely, insanely high student loans down really fast or something. You know what I mean? Like, that's what you should do. I hated that class, but I really enjoyed the other two classes I took for English. I took a horror terror class, and we were Dracula and Frankenstein and Carmilla, and it was all about vampires and werewolves, so that was fun. I loved that class. And I took introductory English course. That had a lot of Tudor England in it, and I'm obsessed with Tudor England, so I really enjoyed that professor. He would get so excited when he would teach. He was so passionate. He would literally bounce around the, the lecture hall while he was talking to us, and uh, I really, really enjoyed that to the point that I left and I went and did nursing for two years, and then I came back and I did a double major in English and history, and I actually emailed him and said, I'm back now. For someone who wanted to get a degree in history, you know, what would you recommend? And he actually emailed with me back and forth a little bit and was trying to help me, give me some guidance, which I thought was really, really nice. So there are some good professors and there are some good classes that you can take that aren't all grade heavy. And obviously you're going to make it more easy on yourselves if you pick something that you know you'll get a good grade in and you make it as easy as possible. But I still think if you do enjoy literature and you do enjoy history, to pick something, you know, you still have a lot of options. So pick something that you do find somewhat interesting. Because that horror terror class was really, really good. And if I was just going for easy, I might not have taken it. Because if I'm right, it was a second year class and I was only a first year student. I don't think it was a first year option. You could still take it. But if I was going for what Joe's saying and being strictly easy and strictly, I wouldn't have taken it. I would have missed out on that. So if something jumps out at you, you're more likely to work for it too, right? You're more likely to get more out of it if it's a topic that actually interests you. Mm -hmm. So don't make it, go through university picking the shittiest classes that don't interest you because they look easy and you know, you have four years of hell, you know? You get the grades, but you're bored out of your mind. Like, try and pick something if you see it, grab it, you know? And what I used to do too, I would look at the class and then you could go to the school early, right? Because it's open. And I would walk through the bookstore and I would check out the reading that was, you can see the books in the bookstore for each class and it would give you an idea of what books they were reading in that class and that's a good way to if you have some time and you're able to do that when you go to check out the school and everything when you, before you pick your classes you can kind of scope out what books they're reading and you can still drop and change and everything up until the first couple of weeks anyway as long as there's room in the class so 
I used to go and scope out what the other classes were reading and see if there was anything there that would interest me that I might want to read. And that was a good way to make your choice too. Nursing was very different. Nursing is like what Joe was saying. There was right and wrong answers, you know, it was, it's like history. If you get the date wrong, you're wrong. You know, if you get the wrong historical figure mixed up with the wrong time period, you're wrong. Like there is a right and a wrong answer. It's not all opinion based. Nursing was like that. Nursing was very, very science heavy and uh, clinical heavy. So in your guys' English major opinion, is the author dead? Is the objectivity in fiction? Or is everything just lenses and interpretations? Oh. Thank you for the bits. Oh, no. Take your bits back. I don't want to answer that question. Take them back. Take them back. Oh, my God. Did you really just ask that question? Oh, no. How much time do we have? Get, it's, go, it's go, 12.43. Go, go get the coffee on. Really? Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> English major opinion to what uh, we did would the equivalent of a year, maybe a year and a half for me. So really, we're not, we're not that educated. The author isn't dead. The author is dying. Author is on their deathbed. Okay, so death of the author. I have a script on this. Okay, so here's where it gets complicated because when I explain this, they're going to be half of people in chat are going to say, no, Joe, you're wrong. That's not what it means because it means different things to different people. I would argue that the way that some people think it is wrong. I might actually say the wrong explanation first to then go on to correct what I think is the wrong opinion that most people have about Death of the Author. A lot of people haven't even heard of it. On the surface, Death of the Author sounds like once something is written, or a game is created, or a song is released, or anything like that, the author is dead, therefore they no longer have any say on how it is received and what they meant by it. A lot of people seem to think that that's what that means, that's what death of the author means, because that's the most simple way to take that. That is not what it means. Death of the author means that to only go by the author's intention is to impose a limitation on the text or to impose a limitation on the song or anything like that. It does not mean that the author doesn't get to say and it does not mean that the author's opinion is irrelevant. It just means that there can be more discussions and more interesting things and discourse can come about from the work if for the sake of conversation and discussion that you can assume that the author's intention is not the only valid interpretation of it. And that is very, 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 very different than the author doesn't get a say. I agree with what I think is the correct version of Death of the Author. And as I say in the script, if you disagree with me, we can invoke death of the author on the idea of death of the author, and I can go, fuck you, my interpretation of it is just as valid. So that's how I view it. I think authorial intent is still very important, and I will argue in almost every case that what the author intended is always going to be vastly more interesting and vastly more engaging than whatever shitty fucking theory that someone who wanted to be a writer and couldn't hack it thought of in the professor lounge, you know what I mean? But I'm bitter about that, so maybe you shouldn't listen to me. At the same time, my interpretation of what remains of Edith Finch is likely not the intended interpretation. And I think that my version of what's going on in the point of Edith Finch is a lot more interesting than what the intended version of it might be. So maybe I'm a dirty, bad hypocrite. But to bring it to video games, that might be a good example. Will we ever know what the original intention of Edith Finch was? Probably not. But I can make a video on it explaining what I think and explaining what I think it all means and what the message of it is. I think the message of Edith Finch is that you shouldn't blindly trust what prior generations tell you and we can see what destructive outcomes can be reached if that is the case and that they're given too much weight. I wish I had gone into more detail about that in the video because I think it would have made a really interesting discussion topic. But unfortunately, when I started talking about it, I knew that I was already getting close to an hour and I don't like making videos 
Despite how long the videos are, I don't really like making long videos, and Edith Finch was meant to be a shorter one. I think that interpretations and dismissing the authorial intent can lead to very interesting discussions, and it is worthwhile to always at least assume for the sake of some discussions that the author is dead, and we can see things that weren't really meant to be there, but at the same time you always have to remember that writers like James Joyce liked to fuck with those people, and would intentionally put things into their book to fuck with those people, that they strongly disagreed with this outlook, and they wanted to make it difficult for someone to properly change what the author intended, you know what I mean? I'm not explaining that very well, but yeah. So, the author is dying, is my answer to that. Not dead. What do you think, Lily? I think... I don't have a strong feeling, I don't think, on either way. I feel like my favorite part of English in university was when we would discuss why the author, or the author, the author had written something. I can't speak tonight. I'm really sorry, guys. Every, I'm really I, tired from last night. I didn't get much sleep. I, th I think I think maybe we should do that. I think we should make an English university course. And the one rule is that every single book that we study has to be written by a guy named Arthur. Arthur. So we can say... This Arthur. <laughs> Did we read a book, the Arthurian, the Canterbury Tales or whatever, the Arthurian <laughs> romance? The Arthur is clearly going for this. <laughs> you know what I mean. I know you anyway, um, that was my favorite part about taking English in university was when we would talk about what was going on in the author's life, what was going on during that time, because I love history, right? So what was going on and where they lived, what was going on in that time period that might have inspired the author to have written this book and there or this character was possibly representative of their mother or you know whatever I, I really enjoyed the little details that then made the story kind of come alive more for me a lot of people don't like that i really enjoyed it as someone who also writes i feel like i know my characters better than you do i'm sorry but i thought them up I know their motivations. I know Ooh. what I meant to say. Are we going to talk about copyright law tonight as well? No, that's you just, want to get it all out there. That's how I feel. That's but I'm not done. I'm not. I'm not finished. That's not all of it. I think it's extremely flattering if you read my book and you have your own opinion on it. Yeah, it's true. I'm not offended if you think I'm wrong. I'm not offended if you think the story should have been told a different way, or that I should have continued on, or something should have been different. I'm really flattered that you're invested enough in the characters that you want to make it yours that you got something different out of it. So I don't really have a strong opinion, really, because I kind of agree with both. I agree that you should read something and make it yours and have a personal connection with it and make up your own reasons, or whether it be a song or a movie or I read Gone Girl, maybe I got something out of Gone Girl that you didn't, you know? Okay, let me counter with this, okay? Let me counter with this. I'm not saying you agree with death of the author, okay? I'm not saying that, but some people mangle the definition of it. What if someone read your book and decided in the same way that those nut jobs decided that Helter Skelter was full of messages, right? That your book is about white supremacy. And suddenly there was a group that was rallying behind it thinking it's about white supremacy and they were using that as a recruitment tool and there was another group that was condemning you for writing a pro white supremacy whatever book but can't you say that about anything you can't say that about anything that's why i don't like the extreme take on death of the author that's why i'm really really hesitant to... that's a really extreme example like it's really it's really out there but helter skelter mm -hmm. you know like I, like I, 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 that's that's why I really don't like the mangled version of Death of the Author. No, I see that. I, I don't know. I um, I like to listen to music and take away what I like from the lyrics. I like to read a book and take away what I thought about the characters. I, I like to be able to take away. I like to know why they did what they did, but I like that to also be personal, and maybe there needs to be a balance of that. I don't know. I would never, and I have never read something and went, no, you're wrong, it should have been like this. I've never done that. I can't think of one book that I've ever read that I would argue, like with Fahrenheit 451, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. That I would argue like that, that no, it's about this. It's not about that, you know? Right, okay. okay. I, don't, I don't have that, I've never had that feeling. Yeah, so anyone doesn't know about that, a lot of people think that Fahrenheit 451 is about censorship. And it isn't. 
It isn't. It isn't about censorship. I wish I had said this. Thank you for bringing it up. I even talked about it in the script that I wrote. Fahrenheit 451 is not about censorship. It's just not. And the guy who wrote it has gone to lectures and been told by people who are sitting in the audience when he says it's not about censorship, they tell him he's wrong. He's the one who wrote it. It actually happened. He just fucking left. He was so pissed. Like he, I think I would be pissed too. I would yeah. be flattered that they are invested enough that they felt this strongly about something that I thought up. But at the end of the day, I thought it up. You know, it's, if how can you do that? I don't know how you can do that. I've never been able to do that, so I don't know how you do that. No, that's wrong. Like how can you go to that extreme that you're telling the author, no, you don't know your own plot, you don't know your own characters, you don't know your own motivations, you don't know, you don't know what your own story was about. Mm -hmm. Like that's going further than this meant something to me. Okay, but here's an interesting point someone just said in chat. Sounds like he didn't deliver his message, but you're assuming that when I read it, it was clear to me what the message was. And I think in an attempt to kind of dissuade people, there's even a new afterword in there as well that's been added. But you might be right, maybe he did fail, or was the book co-opted by a movement that wanted it to be about something else instead of what it actually is about? Because without getting political right now, if Fahrenheit 451 is a book that is quite celebrated and is considered quite important, but the climate that we're in at the moment, specifically without condoning or condemning it about representation in media, okay? It, Fahrenheit 451 is not the popular opinion at all. Like, if Fahrenheit 451's message is not a good one or a popular one at the moment, even though I would think that it's worth discussing. So, like, yeah, you might be right. Maybe he didn't deliver his message well. Or maybe it's that so many people decided that their interpretation was correct, that they got together and changed what the discussion was about around that book. And I think that would be extremely frustrating. And that's when I think death of the author can be quite destructive. It's too strong of a word, but let's that's go with it. That's the I was just thinking. It's funny that you said that. But isn't it kind of like somebody read one of my books and then said, no, they're not the killer? Well, kind yeah. of. No, it's wrong. No, if you had have told it this way and Well, this, people do that. You know, this person might have, you know, but then you're changing the book, right? So Don't, then is it even mine anymore? Aren't there aren't there, just, aren't there movies where fiction? aren't there movies where there are fan theories that take over the actual theory and people get obsessed with them and say that yeah, it is, you know, like there's fan theories. I think there's one about the thing, isn't it? That the ending of the thing is different than what the movie kind of leads it to believe or something and yeah, and and I and I think that's but it's that that's that's more objective details, right? You know, what is, who, who is the killer compared to what are the major themes of your book? Just saying, where do you draw the line? You know, when does it stop? Because then it's just up for so much interpretation that if you can argue about the themes and what the story is really, really trying to say, then you can, you can get down into the more of the detailed elements, right? And break it down. And, mm -hmm. and then you might get someone who... They might send me an email saying, oh, I really enjoyed your book, but I think you're wrong. I think this should have happened instead. And I might read it and go, oh, wow, you're right. That would have been better. Can someone with a car come pick me up? <laughs> Can I get an Uber in Factorio, please? I don't know. To be honest, it's not something I really think about. I really don't think about it. I write my books and people used to read them and now people don't. So I just write them anyway and, you know hope people read them and hope that they care enough about them to have a strong opinion about it and I would be flattered if I got an email saying that they did and that's great but when I was going to university I really was on the other side of it enjoying the speculating so wait wait are you saying H when you say H yeah I don't know if it's a British thing or if it's a Joe thing but I pronounce the letter H as H not H. Sometimes I will probably say H because I'm just a mess of when it comes to different cultures, but I usually say H. Like if I say HP, I will say HP instead of HP. It's not a British thing, it's a being wrong thing. Maybe it's in certain parts of Britain they say H. All right, what parts of the world pronounce H as H? All right, BBC News did a thing with H or H. Why would you pronounce it without the H when that is the letter? Like, that's right there. It's the letter H. 
So why wouldn't you put a H in front of it? It makes complete fucking sense to me. Why would you be like, oh, it's the letter. I'm going to make the letter that I'm saying silent in the word that describes the fucking letter. Like, what? It's like dropping it from herb. Yeah, I don't understand that either. Herb. herb. Nothing triggers me more than people saying herb instead of herb. It's herb. I'm not 100% consistent with my language rules. I probably am a hypocrite, but like, it's... Like, it's herb. Never studied Spanish, I see. Oh, what tipped you off? The fact that I've never spoken Spanish in my life on stream? Like... The pronunciation of common words has changed drastically over time. So as the British Library begins a quest to record people's articulations, what do the differences in how we pronounce words say about us? Pedants beware. The sound of says, eight, mischievous, harass, garage, schedule, and H is shifting. Once upon a time, there were gales of laughter when Frank Spencer and some mothers do avum pronounced harass with the emphasis on the second syllable. Now, according to the British Library, evidence suggests that for people under the age of 35, it is becoming the favored pronunciation. Indeed, the younger you are, are, the more likely you are to make says rhyme with lays rather than fez. Oh no! Who says says? That's what I says. No, you don't say says. Who the, who the hell says says? It says, right? Simon says? Maybe I've said it says at one point in my life, but say that sounds wrong to me. Okay. Eight rhyme with late rather than bet. Oh, God. Who says I at that? Oh, that sounds awful. Oh. Oh, yeah. I at a burger. No. Oh, oh, that's wrong. Oh, oh, ew. I don't like that at all. It's terrible saying that. No, I don't like that at all. No, 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 no. I don't know why that really, really bothers me. And add a whole new syllable to mischievous, turning it into mischievous rather than mischievous. Mischievous. Okay, I like either of those. This is fine. Mischievous or mischievous is fine to me. I think I will go back and forth on these ones. The British Library now wants to get a clearer idea of how spoken English is changing by recording as many people as possible reading the opening paragraph of the Mr. Men book, Mr. Tickle. <laughs> what the hell is this article? The library sociolinguist Johnny Robinson picked the passage because it's well known, easy to read, and will probably be read with as normal a voice as possible. He does not want people to put on a posh speaking voice. It's part of the library's forthcoming Evolving English exhibition and aims to show how pronunciation is not a matter of right and wrong, but merely fashion. I agree. This is true. This is true. I'm truing. This is pretty true. Pretty true. Pretty true. Mario? 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 Mario 64? One exhibit is the BBC's Guide to Pronunciation from 1928. In it, it informs announcers that pristine rhymes with wine. Prist pristine? Respite is pronounced as if there were no E. Combat is combat. <laughs> finance was finance. Even then, some of the suggestions were becoming archaic. Not only is housewifery no longer pronounced huzzy fry. <laughs> it is almost entirely obsolete as a word. Huzzy fry. This article I'm reading right now is called H or H. How do you pronounce H by David Saletto on BBC News. Okay, this is a pretty long article. I'm getting kind of bored. I'm a millennial. Quite why some words changes on who writes quite why? That's a weird way of saying that, isn't it? I don't think I've ever seen anyone ever say quite why. Quite why some words change is unknown. Because while many are important uh, importations from America, schedule turning into schedule. All right, schedule, I don't know why I am British and I really don't like it when people say schedule. That, that bothers me. That's like saying herb without the H to me. I really don't like schedule. Schedule is how you say it. Schedule is almost certainly a consequence of American films and television. The gradual shift of garage to sound like garage is less easy to explain. Go in the garage, garage. I, I think I go back and forth on those two, garage and garage. I think I go back and forth on those, yeah, for sure. So too, is there a mystery as to why certain pronunciations cause a strong feeling? Take the eighth letter of the alphabet, pronounce it H, and then look for the slightly agonized look in some people's eyes. 
<laughs> or, or say the most famous character in video games and some say all of art. One suggestion is that it touches on a long anxiety in English over the letter H. In the 19th century, it was normal to pronounce hospital, hotel, and herb without the H. Nowadays, H anxiety has led to all of them acquiring a new sound, a beautifully articulated H at the beginning. America has perhaps hung on to its H-less herb because it has less class anxiety attached to pronunciations. All right. However, the link between class, voice, and status is not what it once was. Many of us are barely aware of how we say says or ate or what was once considered the right or proper way. Okay. Well, to me, it's clearly H and it always has been. I don't understand. Like if you rhyme cloth, wrath, and off with north and wharf, then you are in a small declining tribe. So if you say cl cloth, 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 Roth, oh, Roth. So Cloth, Roth, and Off with North and Wharf. Roth? I don't think it should be Roth, it should be Wrath. Off or Off. What's happening in this street? We're learning about pronunciations. How do you pronounce Z? Z, I don't say Z. Canada, they do say Z though, and I don't like that. I prefer Z. Although I don't hate it, it's fine. Thoughts on writing mysteries into a story. They more than anything depend on their payoff and that makes them very interesting to me. So here's a hot writing take. The core of all writing is actually mystery writing. This is not how it's always gonna be or always has been, but right now we're in a period of writing or storytelling that everything is really about mysteries, but it's a very broad take on mysteries. And basically the mystery that you wanna hook readers into right now is what happens next? And everything is built around that. And every single word that you put into your story in almost any story that you will read at the moment or even watch will be based around the anticipation of like, ooh, what do you think this means? While also revealing more of mysteries that you set up in the past and just set up, set up, set up, go, 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 set up and pay off all the way through. So saying that it's not always gonna be like that or always hasn't been like that is maybe incorrect. But when I was in writing class in high school, which was just a complete fucking waste of time, we were all taught that all writing is based on conflict and conflict is what makes things interesting and you will see a lot of the same kind of things parroted all the time that the big things you want in writing are conflict and you want character development and you want character arcs and you want to show not tell blah 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 and a lot of people will latch onto these things and take them as gospel and these are the objective truths that come from good writing and i I'm so annoyed at how a lot of people have latched on to the whole character arc thing that I just want to kind of roll my eyes whenever it comes up because it's just like show don't tell a very easy thing to just shotgun out and you make it sound like you know what you're talking about when in reality you're just trying to make yourself sound more educated and more informed of why you don't like something you can just say you don't like something it's fine these sort of things are rules at the moment for the most part but could there be a story that's great that isn't based around conflict? Yeah, of course. You know, there's nothing integral to that that needs to be there. There are exceptions to every rule. There are plenty of characters that you don't want to have character development on. There are plenty of characters that you don't want to have a big character arc on. There could be something very worthwhile in having a very long series or a long TV series or a long book series. And there is a character that throughout the whole thing is this constant anchor that doesn't change throughout the whole thing as a source of poetic comparison or just as a joke. You know what I mean? Like it could just be really, really funny if there was a whole character that just, you know, goes through hell and at the end of it, along with another group and at the end of it, it's just completely unchanged. And you look at it like, what the hell is your problem? You know what I mean? There's always going to be exceptions to the rule. So I've watched a bunch of Ryan George's pitch meeting series and I think they're very, very funny, but the way that he will sometimes shotgun out criticism, that sort of thing, he's being funny. So I'm not ragging on the guy here. Like he's supposed to be very succinct and funny. He doesn't have much time to put into it. You know, don't, don't you think we should have character arcs in this thing? And what about his arc and blah, blah, blah. This this is something that comes up and the straw man that's writing a really bad script is like, nope, I don't give a shit about that. You know, it's kind of juvenile to just look at writing and just break it apart into these like very objective pieces. And it has to be this, has to be that, have to be this, have to be that, you know, but in general, sure, it does make sense. The one that bothers me the most, though, is show don't tell because it's just not true. I don't know how you would properly go through most books and measure it, but I would hazard a guess that it's at least 50-50 that every single book you read is 50 tell versus 50 show, 50% 50 versus 50%. There are lots of times where you want to tell. 
lots and lots and lots of times. It's show when it's important and appropriate to show, tell when it's appropriate and important to show. Another one of writing advice that you will find a lot of writers, very, very famous writers disagree with is write what you know, okay? And I say this in the Witcher 2 video, write what you know is very misunderstood. If you write what you know, you're gonna have a very limited kind of framework. You should definitely research as much as you can and broaden your horizons, but I think it would be more accurate to say, write about what you're interested in and you will have more success with that. And if you're genuinely interested in it, then you will be able to find out more about it quite easily. And write what you know is usually when something gets very technical. So if you are writing what you know, and it turns out that you are writing about a character who's a surgeon and you don't know how to be a surgeon then maybe don't fucking describe anything that goes into the surgery parts and just allude to it instead you know or unless you have time to go and shadow a fucking surgeon for a couple months just don't do it <laughs> anyway so sorry that i went off on a tangent there but yeah i went there from mystery writing being like the core of most writing that you do setting up an anticipation paying it off and if you do that well you can learn a lot of techniques from that that go into like plot mystery where you actually are setting up an actual structured kind of it's not just hey what happens it's no i'm setting up this actual thing that i want you to question and then actually have an answer for later a lot of writing currently is mystery writing in that sense but the writers don't have the answer when they write it, which is just fucking terrifying. And I don't like it because it's usually ends up being a waste of time. JJ Abrams is the king of this shit. And all of lost is like, he has a talk, a very famous talk. I think now about the mystery box kind of writing, like literally a box and it's like, okay, what's in it. And then the audience has to wonder what, and then you reveal later. And inside the mystery box is usually the answer with another mystery box inside of it. And it's just mystery box into mystery box into mystery box. And this can be very compelling. If you actually plan what goes on inside the mystery box, Box. But when a writer builds a mystery box and then sits back and goes, yeah, that's a good mystery box. I wonder what's inside it. Most of the time, it's going to be very, very unsatisfying, especially if they, you know, will go through a lot of fan theories and just, you know, discard a lot of people that predict things. It's like, ah, oh, no, someone, someone guessed what's in the mystery box. Have to get rid of that now. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what do you want something that's compelling and satisfying to your audience? Or do you just want to surprise them? Like, what are you trying to do here? You know, like you can't do this shit, but I find mystery writing to be very compelling and is a very good way of getting people to continue enjoying your story like i enjoy reading those stories but as with everything it's all in how it's done don't set up a mystery unless you know yourself please that would be my only solid concrete answer you're gonna get out of me it's just a waste of time i get so frustrated when writers do this shit and then like it's i think it's even worse when they just don't even answer it like it's not even i didn't know what it was this is that fuck it. i'm just i set up this mystery and that fuck it. you just never get to know like it's just really annoying <laughs> <laughs> oh man zero escape isn't gonna do that right there's no way we're gonna have this shit in vlr on monday right as always i do want to give a qualifier because despite what a lot of people think of me i'm not a big-headed smug asshole on the internet who thinks he knows everything i am not that successful of a writer if you include my scripts as script writing then i'm fairly successful as a writer when it comes to fiction writing like people who read my books enjoyed my books and i got a lot of good feedback from it but like if i was a successful enough fiction writer you wouldn't be listening to me right now so you might want to take any of my writing advice with a pinch of salt is it a pinch of salt or it is pinch of salt right i don't know it's pinch of salt isn't it grain of salt is it grain? can you do both can you say pinch of salt and grain of salt it can be pinch or grain okay is it h or h Grain of ketchup. It'd be nice to get back to writing though. I miss it. I really enjoy writing. I've gotten much better at the script writing at least. I wonder how much that would, that would translate over to fiction writing. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would actually make it harder. I don't know. Nonfiction writing is very, very different. In nonfiction writing, you want to have thesis statements. Even though my videos don't typically have a thesis, and I don't really consider my videos to be essays, but they're definitely in the essay area. So there's a thesis statement for an essay that starts at the beginning of the essay itself. And then there's thesis statements that you could have at the beginning of paragraphs. Chuck Palahniuk talked about this, and I've spoken about this in Q and A's as well. Chuck Palahniuk, he's the guy who wrote Fight Club. He had a interview or some writing advice that he wrote like fucking over a decade ago now, I think. And it stuck with me. It's one of the most important pieces of writing advice that I ever read. And it was that you need to avoid thesis statements in your creative writing and a thesis statement in this context is when you open up a paragraph let's say your main character's name is Jim and it will start off like this 
Jim woke up and got himself ready for the day. Okay? That's the first sentence of this paragraph. The rest of the paragraph will then describe the process of Jim getting himself ready for the day and waking up. Okay? In this case, so let's say Jim woke up and got himself ready for the rest of the day. Jim went downstairs and got some breakfast and coffee brewing. When he went upstairs, brushed his teeth, took a shit and had a shower. And he knows he was out of soap. And now he had to plan that he had to go get some more soap for the rest of the day. When he went downstairs, his coffee was cold. Okay, this is the whole paragraph, okay? In this paragraph... Your story is 100% improved if you just delete the first sentence, okay? You do not need the first sentence, okay? This is a thesis statement where the first sentence describes what you are about to say and then you say it, okay? So in fiction writing, once you notice that writers do this, and you get adept at picking it up. A lot of people, especially even properly published writers do this. It is very aggravating and it's very annoying. In nonfiction writing, this is a good thing to do because you're trying to make a persuasive argument and you're trying to open up the audience or the reader into seeing your point and understanding your point. It doesn't have to agree with your point, but you are trying to persuade the reader or audience into thinking you have a point, whether they agree with it or not. That's secondary. It's like, first of all, hey, look, I am saying something of substance here, whether you agree with it afterwards, we'll get to that. In nonfiction writing, it's very, very important to do that. And it can be a good source of flow and easing someone into a point that you're about to make. And especially when you're going to evidence in creative writing, you almost never want to do this shit. So the other thing to do in nonfiction writing is that, especially when you're making scripts and videos like mine is evidence and examples are really, really important. I probably go overboard with them, but my primary purpose with videos is to not be entertaining. It's to make my point and support my point. Although I will say in some of my most successful videos, I do that the least and people seem to respond to it. So maybe I should stop doing it. I think I did a really good balance with it in Elden Ring and that was born out of trying to be faster so maybe the limitation there ended up being a good thing i didn't like overcrowd it with examples like i did in some other videos but i really really like how many examples i had in the odyssey video and i knew that i had to be air fucking tight with that one so sometimes it is appropriate and when i go back and watch the odyssey video i'm fine with it so i still like it so it depends whereas in fiction writing you really don't want to do that and you only want to say what's important you don't have to take like Chekhov's gun kind of thing to its extreme. No, no, no. You can have some flavor text in there and some useless things that don't come back later, but you do want to trim it down that you're not going overboard with it. If you've listened to my videos or listened to me talk here, I don't know. How do I come across in streams compared to the videos? I don't know. Sometimes I can waffle on here for sure, but maybe I'm more direct here with answering questions than I am on videos. I don't know. But if you've ever watched my videos and listened to me go overboard with examples, you might be surprised if you went and read my fiction and found that it's very direct. My style in creative writing is possibly too succinct. Like I'm probably too brief in a lot of descriptions that I go through, especially when it comes to fantasy, because I hate that in fantasy books. I go through the plot as quickly as I can. And wasting your time is something I'm very, very aware of. Whereas in the videos, I'm like, eh, I could probably waste a little bit of your time if it makes my point. I have more evidence and support for it. In my opinion, fiction writing feelings before facts. Hmm. I think that a feeling should always inform how you're writing and I always like to be anchored to a character's perspective whenever I'm writing and that their feelings will inform how the prose is written, you know? Like if someone is in a very direct and kind of panicked mood, it's going to be more short and stilted kind of descriptions and we're going to get to the meat of the issue very, very quickly. If someone is more in a contemplative state, there's going to be longer paragraphs. This is mostly kind of basic shit, but it's hard to remind yourself of that sometimes. You have to practice the fundamentals of writing perspectives, that sort of thing. Can the repetitive writing of 999 be considered thesis writing? No, I don't think so. I think that's something else instead. That's more like introducing a topic. I think that's fine. This might be dumb to ask of Witcher video, Joe, <laughs> but do you have any tips on writing short, concise stuff, like summarizing a fictional historical event in a few paragraphs? No, when I'm not doing evidence-based stuff, my problem is actually getting words on the page, not taking them away. I would suggest maybe you don't give a shit about how long it is and you just write down everything that you need to have and then just get to your word limitation by a process of elimination just get it all out and then boil and condense as much as you possibly can or you could just have it all listed out in bullet points and find a way that you can combine topics and string sentences together in the best way that you can but it's kind of hard with that example and if you gave an example it would be too much to go into on stream how do you feel about never writing said when writing dialogue? I think stuff like that is bullshit, but 
it might not be later on. So use of certain words, especially adverbs, come and go. Sometimes it can be seen as kind of trite and slows everything down, not artistic. And then other times we get into this mode where bare bones storytelling is seen as too simplistic and we want more flowery language. So it depends, you know, ask me again in 10 years and I might say, oh man, you should never say said, you should always have a description word instead. But usually I just prefer to have the emotion delivered in the dialogue itself and the context of what's going on. You know, most of the time you don't even want to say the character who's speaking. You should just understand flow of the conversation as it's going, you know, obviously it's unavoidable. Sometimes you have to, but like, fuck Cormac McCarthy's The Road doesn't even have speech marks. It's just, it's just text. And it works. Do you have any strong opinions about the hero's journey in writing? Oh, you. Oh, don't try and pass this off as an innocent question. You know what you're doing. You'll know too much about that soon. Don't worry. Would you agree with me that the vertical leveling system shouldn't exist in Witcher 3? It breaks the story, world building, economy, and they already have viable progress barriers and contingencies for different play order. Oh, man, you're going to love the video. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But wouldn't you agree that the thesis statement thing is kind of like show, don't tell? No, I don't think so. I can't think of an example in creative writing unless you are subverting the expectation set up in the first sentence where you explain what the character is about to do and then you go through it. Maybe at the beginning of a chapter or a long section, you could do that and that sets the expectation of what the character is about to do and you get into that mode and mindset. Sure, that could work, but then it's kind of getting back into an evidence place, right? It's like, here's the proposal of what the character is going to do and here's all my evidence laying out what is exactly that they do, especially if the character is trying to solve a problem. But in terms of like condensed to a single paragraph, I'm sure there is an exception somewhere, but an exception on the level of like, it's a 50-50 split, like show versus tell is versus in most books. I don't think so. As a writer, there are times when I do thesis writing intentionally where the narrator starts by spoiling the end of the scene to hook the reader into that scene. And by the, oh, okay, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that That's framing, man. Like, that's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do that too. That can be great. Yeah. Okay, so that's throughout a whole scene. I'm specifically talking about like something that's condensed or constricted to just one paragraph. So when your paragraph starts with a sentence, that is a summary of the rest of the paragraph. That is the only thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about thesis writing and why it's bad in virtually like every case. In terms of a scene, yeah, for sure. That definitely has merit.